Okay, I'm going to uh, switch to English if that's okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nicola, uh, for this very kind introduction. And uh, thank you very much as well to the uh, Troya uh, Code d'Azur for uh, giving me the honor of uh, awarding me an international chair. Um, and in fact, it's uh, it's quite interesting to me, given the fact that uh, I'm a uh, alma mater from uh, from uh, uh, Côte d'Azur, from uh, from uh, the University of Côte d'Azur, from Minoria, when I did my PhD with uh, uh, Xavier Nicola and others um, uh, a few years ago. So it's a bit like back home. Unfortunately, I cannot be there physically. Uh, I would like first to um, uh, put the center um, uh, into perspective with respect to uh, what is value-based healthcare. Um, and I think it's important to appreciate that uh, uh, we are going through a big change, dramatic change of the healthcare business model at present. Uh, the way that uh, um, healthcare is actually running, and it's actually quite an international model, is um, uh, it's a pretty straightforward model. The more patients you have, the more procedure you have, the more reinvestment you have, the more uh, cost uh, uh, it, it actually provides, uh, and therefore the more money uh, an hospital is making. Uh, the challenge of this model is uh, it's clearly not sustainable. And uh, if you look at this graph, it shows you very clearly uh, that after the 80s, healthcare costs start out of this uh, by quite a margin. I do apologize, but I received some echo back. So whoever is not uh, muted might want to mute itself. Thank you. Um, and, and if you were comparing now the cost, uh, the inflation index with the medical care inflation index, just to put things into perspective, a pint of milk uh, will actually be worth in England something like uh, five pounds, uh, which is will be clearly uh, not uh, what anyone will expect to pay. Um, so we have to change the model and uh, a lot of companies and especially large companies like Medtronic and Siemens Elsenia have been looking at this very, very carefully. Um, and, and really went from what we'll say a fee uh, for service model to a fee for outcome model, uh, where now uh, the health outcome and the cost per patient is really what's going to drive the healthcare cost. And it's a completely different change uh, of paradigm. And it's really rely on how you can optimize this criteria and how we can make sure that the patient is at the center of care. So we go from really population um, uh, solution to really precision medicine. And this is really what has been driving the agenda of what we call healthcare for Doto, uh, which is um, which is um, uh, really what we've been uh, we've been uh, embracing, and and we believe that uh, artificial intelligence and especially data uh, use of data, uh, advanced imaging, data science, and artificial intelligence will actually really support the delivery of value-based healthcare. It's not going only to benefit the patient. It will benefit our healthcare system, and I believe anything that we talk about within the NHS can be deployed as well in a French um, um, uh, healthcare uh, system. Um, and it will, of course, uh, drive the um, uh, economy growth, uh, because as you, I'm sure you know, uh, this is quite a vibrant area from an innovation and, and, and enterprise creation perspective. And something which is really at the core of it, where uh, places um, um, developing computer science, data expertise, and so on, are really well positioned to support this, is really the convergence of the need expertise um, that we have in an hospital to really get the right type of people to understand the patient pathways of, the, of, of how the patient is actually going through treatment. So really, how do we transform those pathways? Uh, exploitation of the data, um, uh, exploitation of new AI model and, and data at scale, and very importantly, uh, doing this in tandem with industry. And, and if you have been working in healthcare, you might certainly know that there is a huge lag between the development of innovation and its translation into the healthcare environment. And I must say that uh, COVID-19 has been quite a wake-up call, not only from the population and public health point of view, but as well from the transformation point of view. And a lot of hospitals, especially um, uh, in fact, in, in our local environment in, in, in the UK, but I'm sure in France as well, had to really embrace the opportunity of exploiting data to better serve their patients. Uh, so there really the solution we have been putting forward, which is really uh, uh, very similar to the um, uh, healthcare uh, theme of the Troia, is, is the development of an AI center, uh, which at the core of it has our NHS uh, hospital partners. 
The first um, phase of the center was funded uh, in 2019 as the order of 10 million pounds from Invet UK. And a bit like you just mentioned about uh, being able to leverage external funding, to get this money, we had to demonstrate 10, 10 million pounds of support from, from industry. It has been already at the start quite a large partnership involving three universities, King's College London being the lead university with Imperial College and Queen Mary. Uh, four hospitals, the three key hospitals of King's Health Partners, Guys and St. Thomas, King's College Hospital and the Mosley, which is the largest mental health hospital in the country, and the Barts Health, which is a very large hospital linked with Queen Mary with a very strong focus on, on respiratory and cardiac um, uh, activities. Um, we have identified 12 pathways within the hospitals that we want to uh, influence. Most of them at the start were really around imaging. Um, we uh, gathered 10 startups uh, which are um, uh, directly interested by those pathways and four main industry partners and most notably um, Siemens, uh, Elsenir um, and um, uh, NVIDIA. But since then we have many others like IBM and Hawking, a French startup in federated learning which have been joining us. Um, and we saw a very rapid interest uh, from the um, government to support this activity. So after this injection of 10 million pounds in February 19, uh, we were successful to get another injection of 16 million to really, I would say, professionalize what we learn as a proof of concept of this phase one uh, in the informatics and data gathering exercise. And to really work towards creation of a standard uh, for large scale data analytics in the hospital. We, we take advantage of this investment to increase the size of the population we can target. And all, all of our hospitals in London are very much linked with the South East of, of England. And then we uh, identified another uh, seven NHS trusts to join us um, at another university, UCL, um, and um, being able now to basically reach over 20 million uh, uh, patients uh, through uh, this consortium. Um, this is a new phase. It will start in January 2021. And we've really been spending the, the last um, uh, year to build the requirements of how to design an AI enabled uh, uh, hospital infrastructure. And people might think, you know, electronic health records are there to solve this problem. And in fact, electronic health records uh, have been really there to make sure that we can build properly our patients, that we make, can make sure that we know what is happening to this patient in terms of the different treatment uh, that this patient is received or the different uh, biomarkers that we are extracting from this patient. It hasn't been really designed uh, to make your hospital intelligent. So if you really want to develop an AI-enabled hospital infrastructure, research is clearly important. However, large informatic uh, solutions are really the key and you need to be research ready and especially in the data side, you need to be um, uh, patient privacy friendly. You need to be able to have proper governance for your models uh, and for your data. Uh, you need to have local compute. Not everything can be done on the cloud using raw data from the hospital. And, and you need to be able to scale your data models uh, to enable it to be fair and equitable uh, and not uh, biased towards the demographic of the population of your specific hospital. And one big change, I would say, from a research point of view uh, um, of using what we call clinical data and working on clinical data science versus um, the type of AI that most of the people have been doing is a concept of real-time actionable data. Uh, usually when you do research, you take what we will call a static snapshot. At certain point, you will get data, you will get those data to your lab, you will generate a new model, a new AI-based solution, and then you will go back to the hospital. And what we really want to present is a model which is intelligence in real-time actionable. And then therefore, you can, you can really um, uh, change the pathway of the patient in real time. And we need to make sure that actually this is uh, robust and doesn't break very easily as you've got uh, the, basically the future of your patient in your hand uh, with your um, intelligence system. And there is huge amount of challenge in clinical data science. And I'm not going to have time to describe all of them, but I will say that most of the data are dirty, they are unstructured. Um, uh, Quite often, there is missing information. Uh, there is very limited amount of common ontology which are applied to those data. Um, people tend to uh, do search on very much unstructured data those days. There is very limited informatics um, uh, infrastructure in hospital, and I think this is fair to say this is an international challenge. Um, 
and um, you have as well the challenge of the size. Uh, most of the model uh, needs to um, run on very large uh, data sets, which are not always available in one single hospital. Um, so really, the type of challenge we have to solve, and I was quite slightly sorry when I started this journey, I'm not really research oriented, they are really infrastructure oriented. And it's perhaps one of the reasons that the industry have been not picking this up really very readily, um, um, because the people who are really more interested about this are people doing research and make sure that our research can have an impact to patient. We need to make sure that our research ready. We need to make sure that we've got proper data governance and patient privacy. We need to make sure we've got a governance framework around our models. And we need to make sure that we formalize uh, this infrastructure if we want really to make a difference at scale and get this deployed in multiple hospitals and hopefully internationally. And I mentioned many of the partners already. I mentioned them again on the right. And now what I'm going to try to do, which is going to be very, very quick, uh, given the very short time I've got, is what is this infrastructure and how it looks like. One of the first key points was we believed on, on using um, um, uh, open source software. And we've been discussing with key partners, such as Siemens and IBM and NVIDIA, about making sure that everything we will develop will be open source. Um, the first piece of technology we've been using is XNAT, which is um, 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 a, a research database which enables you to manage, import, archive, and process imaging data. We've been working for over 15 years using XNAT. Uh, we've been a, a main contributor of some of the package um, and uh, working very closely with the team of Dan Marcus at WashU. Uh, usually used for clinical, <coughs> by, by CRO, clinical research organization in research, mostly for managing data. Um, from clinical trials, and um, we, we've been expanding it to be able to link it directly with the packs within the hospital. <clears throat> and again, when we talk about real-world image, real-world problems, one has to understand that those data not only are dirty, but they can be mislabeled. The slide uh, here is showing there's a kind of data you can get into your system that you need really to properly classify, and then you need to, de you need to develop quality control tools, you need to classify your modality, you, you need to be able to generate imputation solutions and have models of uncertainty uh, to be able to make sure your models are unbiased. Uh, for instance, the left image of this MR scan was considered a full brain. You can see clearly this patient has quite a large hemisphere missing. The image on the right has, has motion artifacts due to the patient being claustrophobic, wanted to leave the scanner. And the image on the bottom left was classified as an MR scan on the PAC system, but actually the CT. The image on the right has been classified as an old brain acquisition, and clearly the field of view was wrong. And this is really real world problems that you will be exposed if you start to use clinical uh, data. Um, one thing which is really important is how do you get from structured to unstructured data, and how you do that without being um, um, uh, constrained by one specific electronic health record. Uh, for many years, Kings has been developing a package called CoxStack, um, which um, um, is enable you to manage, import, archive, and process electronic health data, which are unstructured, and structure them using elastic search um, uh, engines, and as well, a combination, of, a combination of, of natural language processing, which enable you to add semantic once you've been able to extract those data. Um, and we, we, we have been exploiting those technology, put them together, and then you can go from a fully unstructured data set to a fully structured data using, using those semantic. Um, the next stage really is once you have semantic out of your data is how you make sure that you are compliant with the standards. Um, and, and, and semantic as a first challenge really is how to make sure that the data you extract with your semantic is appropriate. Um, and something to note, uh, which is quite common in, in medicine, is, is a clinician tends first on the report, on the radiology side, to report what the patient doesn't have rather than what the patient has. So you need to have semantic solutions, which are um, robust to spelling mistakes, typos, nomenclatures, acronyms, negations, and as well family story. Quite often um, uh, on this report, you will identify that the, the clinician stated this, this, this patient has a family story of, let's say, breast cancer. It doesn't mean the patient has breast cancer. And this is a very important research area. Um, and if you really want to get your data used, you need to be having them being compliant with standards, uh, such as HL, S7, FHIR, but as well with SNOMED, CT, and other ontologies, and uh, huge um, uh, involvement from OHDSI to create the OMOP standard, which enable us to actually have one single standard, which once we've got a semantic, enable to having standardized metadata uh, in place. 
And then the last bit is really how do you make these standard data sets uh, being linked properly with the standard of your own hospital. So I'm not sure how it works in, the, in, in France, but in the UK, every single trust has its own, what we call trust integration engine, TIE, and they will define their own standard. So you need to have another layer, which is this green box, to make sure that your data are standardized with respect to the specific hospital. Once we've got this in place, then you can start to really consider AI research and you need again a standard to do that. And with a consortium, which is now over 12 partners and hopefully uh, INRIA as well, and the uh, TRIA, TRIA will be one of the partners in the future, we have developed this package called MONAI, which enables to create state-of-the-art end-to-end training workflows to optimize and standardize way to create those deep learning models. Um, this has a complete portable API, uh, which enables us to fully integrate it uh, once the data has been standardized. Um, and that really creates the whole pipeline, which enables us to go from fully heterogeneous data unstructured to fully actionable model uh, through the combination of, combination of those open source, which will lead to precision medicine, business intelligence, semantic search, being able to do dashboard and live letting, and, and actually be able to action things on time in uh, real time for our patients. Uh, and what is really important now to understand is all of this works really well when you've got access to all of the data and the only thing you need is pseudo anonymization. The challenge you will have, or obviously, is you need to be in the hospital. You need to have all your researcher with an honorary contract. You will have the challenge that there is limited IT support. And as well, uh, the informatic team is not there to support the research. They are there to make sure that the system works for the patient. You have very limited computational power and you will be limited to a single hospital. And it doesn't really allow industry to work with you. And we want industry to work with us at pace. We can't, we can't have them just working with us three or four years later once we have developed our innovation. That will just delay the process. So it's really important that you build this as part of the largest consortiums where you can have more accurate model because you have more data. It can be more generalizable as a model. It will be safer, it will be fairer, and as well, very importantly, it will be equitable. You can't just expect that patients are treated well because they are, part, they are in London or they are in one of the key um, cities in France. You need to be able to provide this solution everywhere. Um, and some hospitals will have very small amount of data, so how do you solve that? And that's really where federated learning has a big role to play. And we've been partnering with, with Hawking for, for a while, but uh, we decided to make our federated learning solution available through Monai, and we want to make it really um, um, open to any other solutions. And again, great opportunity, I think, for people like Marco, who will uh, talk a bit later today, uh, uh, and, and, and getting involved not only with, with the Monai package, but as well with the overall platform. And really what, what federated learning does for you is rather than moving your data, you move the model. So you manage to have a model which learn sequentially between the different data they are exposed to and manage in a smart way to combine those, all of those data uh, without having to see them to build a meta model, which will hopefully have better property. Um, and then once you've got this, you've got really the big part of, of what will be the AI enabled infrastructure of the future of, of, of the future hospital. Um, but really what, what you, you need to do now is to consider um, how you can bring this to the side, which might not be that research intensive, which might not have this entire infrastructure. And this is where we build an AI engine, which we call uh, an AI deployment engine, uh, which enables us to ingress data, um, uh, DICOM data, um, and other non-imaging data via our federated learning platform, and deploy this AI engine on any other trust without having to basically generate an infrastructure dedicated to the hospital. And that enable you to basically take advantage of much smaller um, infrastructure. And we want this to be a uh, vendor neutral. We spend a fair bit of time to build the, the model, the infrastructure. We just finalized the entire software requirement specification and are going for tender uh, for this. Um, and uh, we will be in a position to actually have a first um, minimal viable platform by summer 2021. Uh, it will be Apache to license. Um, and uh, we expect to work as well with industry partner to convert this into a massive medical device in the future. And it has to work really all the time. And that's really where you have massive challenge to, uh, in front of you. Um, I will say in conclusion that there is a huge value in retrospective data. There is amazing possibilities to create new standards and an AI-enabled hospital of the future. Opportunity to bring together academic, clinician, and industry 
at scale and to work across uh, countries and hopefully be able to expand in collaboration with Troia. Thank you very much.